Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Oh, good. Good. If this was a class, I'd start and say, good evening, good evening, until finally I knew everybody was awake. I'll see if that's the same at the end of the lecture. Um, last year, I had the opportunity of presenting Marblehead in 1861. And two fateful days, well, really three, April 14th, April 15th, and April 16th. 1861. And I have to go back to those dates because like the commentator says, I'm going to give you the rest of the story tonight. April 4th, 1861, Fort Sumter has been attacked. The Star of the West expedition to get supplies to Fort Sumter had been attacked and turned around. Lincoln now knows it is an insurrection. He calls for 75,000 volunteers. So on April 15th, into Marblehead comes Lieutenant Colonel Hicks, and he comes up to the butcher shop of Not V. Martin. Notice how I said it as a Marbleheader would. <laughs> Not B. V. Martin is, sit, is standing there butchering a pig. He's told, your regiment is to be in Washington, it is to be in Boston, Massachusetts tomorrow morning. His words, in typical Marblehead fashion, damn the hog, sleeves covered with blood, puts his coat over his arm, and heads down to call the regiment, the three companies of Marblehead together. On April 15th, excuse me, April 16th, sleet and snow. Eight o'clock in the morning, three regiments assemble and march to the train station. Now, where's the train station? Right where the National Grand Bank is. My great-great-grandfather on my mother's side is the conductor, John B. Harris. He loads up two regiments, takes them into Boston to the station, runs it back to Marblehead, picks up the third regiment, and runs it back to Boston. Not B. Martin takes his company C, and Captain Francis Boardman takes his company, and they start marching from the station to Faneuil Hall. Captain Phillips brings the next company. The only problem is when they got to Faneuil Hall, nobody was there. The doors were locked. Martin takes his sword with the hilt and pounds on the door until he gets someone to open the door. That afternoon, that, those regiments muster on Boston Common. The governor of Massachusetts addresses them, and they're sworn into federal service. Then take a train to Worcester, and from Worcester to New York City. And they parade through New York City, and they have a banquet. Pretty good war so far. <laughs> In New York City, they hear of another Massachusetts regiment, the 6th Massachusetts Regiment, that has been going through the city of Baltimore. City of Baltimore, much like most cities, didn't want to give way to technology. And so all trains that came up to Baltimore, the engine had to be disconnected and the railroad cars had to be hauled by horses along the track through the city of Baltimore to the other side where a locomotive would pick them up. The only problem is a mob attacked those train cars going through. A number of Massachusetts soldiers are killed in that attack by the Baltimore mob. The 8th Regiment is in New York. They decided they're not going to march through Baltimore. First good, good decision. They take a ship and they go to Annapolis, Maryland to the Naval Academy. When they get there, they discover the Confederates are not far away. And so Captain Boardman's company details a few of the Marblehead men and a few Salem people. And they take the, the frigate Constitution and they sail her from the Naval Academy to New York. The rest of the regiment starts down the railroad track from Annapolis to Annapolis Junction and finally to Washington, D.C., 20 miles. Confederates have torn up the tracks and 
8th Regiment starts diving in the lakes and the rivers and they find the railroad uh, rails. They pull them up and they start to lay the line. They get to Washington and they are one of the first regiments to come into Washington, D.C. April 1861. Where do you put them? Well, the Capitol building isn't finished yet. The dome is open. They set up their tents in the rotunda, build their fires in the rotunda. It's interesting, I have a letter from a Marblehead soldier named William T. Blackler, unusual last name. He's writing on congressional stationery. He must have sat down at one of the desks, writes a letter to his buddies at the rum shops back in Marblehead. Now, how it got to my family, I have no idea. <laughs> But it's interesting for him to say, there's 15,000 of us here, and who says, but it will probably take years for this to end. How prophetic that he was. Now I tell you that Civil War lasted five years, some will say it lasted four years. I'm going to tell you that Civil War began a long time before the, those guns in April 1861 for the U.S. government to discover that they have an insurrection is just the last part of the beginning of the story. And so from here, I want to tell you about those men and what happened. Over 1,000 men leave the town of Marblehead. The population is 7,600 people. Figure half of them are females. Now 1,000, 48 of them go into military service. That's U.S. Navy, one Marine, and U.S. Army. Out of that 1,000, 110 die. Look at the numbers. One out of 10 who leave and serve will not return to the town of Marblehead. 87 are wounded. That's wounded or dead. Two out of every 10 that serve are either going to be wounded or killed. Take a drive through Waterside Cemetery, go to the back part, start to look at those stones, and you'll see killed at Gettysburg. Just see, for my own information, I looked at the numbers on those five years. 1861, four died, disease. 1862, 28 died. 1863, 16 died. 1864, 61 died. 1865, only four months, six died. And I was thinking, you know, if I was living in the town of Marblehead, and that civil war is going along 1861, 1862, 1863, no one knew which way that Civil War was going to go. But by 1865, those death numbers and those casualties are going sky high. There isn't a single town, a single city that's not impacted by this Civil War. 2.5 million men are involved in this operation on the Union side. just about 600,000 are killed. So now we look at 110 from Marblehead compared to 600,000 that are killed. And what was amazing for me to look at was where they died. Andersonville, 1863, 13. Petersburg, 7. Um, and I, I started to look and say, there isn't a single major battle that there isn't a marble header involved in, either being wounded or being killed. So what is the story? Well, the story is the first person who died in that war did not die out of battle, died of disease. And then came that battle of Roanoke Island. When you're downstairs, you want to look at one of the things, and it talks about Roanoke Island. It's the first major battle. Marblehead loses three 
individuals in that conflict. The first one is killed outright, Lieutenant John Goodwin Jr. And that's why he's picked as the individual, as the name for that post, GAR post. And I have to remind myself of this because when I taught and I was doing the Civil War and I said to kids, GAR, they had no idea what GAR was. And so I had to remind them, it's the Grand Army of the Republic. Now, one of my sister-in-laws came from Georgia. She knew what the GAR was. She belonged to an organization called the Daughters of the Confederacy. But at the end of the war, the Confederates didn't have a veterans organization. And that's going to be part of that story. Not Martin. That captain who pounded on that door at Faneuil Hall. Born in 1820. So how old is he in 1861? He's 41 years of age. Lives on Franklin Street. He's a shoemaker. Uh, he started making shoes when he was 13 years of age and decided that's not for him. And so he became a butcher. He's the captain. In those days, by the way, captains of regiments get their commissions only after they've been elected by the men in the company. So Not Martin had to have some quality that endowed him to the men who are going to serve under. Well, he's the captain of Company C, 8th Regiment. And this shows you what we thought in those days. Nine months service. The war was going to be over in nine months. Well, in 1862, he comes back. And when he comes back, is it amazing? He's welcomed back. He, by the way, is the fire chief. So all the firemen turn out to greet him. And you can see the parade that welcomes him back in 1861. <coughs> 1862, he says, okay. And he becomes a captain at, of Company B, 23rd Massachusetts Regiment. He serves a year there, and he's at the Battle of Roanoke, newborn, uh, Kingston, Battle of White. And by the time he finishes in 1863, he has seen seven major battles. He resigns, comes back to Marblehead, and signs up again. This time, the 58th Massachusetts Regiment, he's transferred automatically to the 59th Regiment, and he's at the Battles of the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, a horrible battle. Uh, Petersburg, a horrible battle. He's wounded in the leg at St. Petersburg and put into a military hospital. He's discharged in 1865. He comes back to Marblehead, and he goes back to butchering. Within a year, we send him to the Massachusetts legislature. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. He returns, but not right away. He's given the job as messenger to the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. Pretty good. <laughs> Somehow, he got the appointment in May 1869 as postmaster of Marblehead, and he serves as postmaster until 1885. He dies in 1898, significant year, because America enters a conflict, the Spanish-American War. And by the way, there are some Civil War vets that are taking part in that battle. He's not the first captain to die, but he dies at 78 years of age. And if you read his obituary, it is fascinating. Esteemed citizen, respected individual within the town. And I said, all right, I'm going to find out. But the rest of these guys, Captain Boardman. Anyone know what Captain Boardman did for a living? <laughs> well, my father could tell me. Probably well, we ran the bakery. He ran the bakery. His father ran the bakery, he ran the bakery. The bakery was up by the old townhouse. My father used to tell the story going up and leaving on a Saturday morning a pot of beans 
that would be put into the ovens and then he was sent back as a little kid to pick up the beans that had been cooked. And you ate, and you, everybody went to Borden's Bakery to have this done. He also is a youngster. He's born in 1827. And he dies in 1904. Uh, he's the third company to reach Boston. He comes back to Marblehead after those nine months and he decides he's going to raise a cavalry unit. He's unsuccessful. Marbleheaders do not like to ride horses. <laughs> he can't get enough of them to sign up. Where do they sign up? Well, they sign up right down there in the square. Across from the uh, art association is the store. It used to be a bank. I'm trying to think who's in there now. It's like a gift shop. It's next to uh, Orn's Printing. Lichman's printing. Upstairs is where all the Civil War recruiting took place. And what they did is they took some of these captains and they went upstairs and waited for people to sign up. 1,148 men either signed up or are drafted. And by the way, at the end of the war, Marblehead has, had gone over its draft number by 90 individuals. Anyone know the significance of a white feather? Yeah. <coughs> Someone that didn't serve. Yeah. If you were dating, a young lady was patriotic. She wouldn't date you. She'd hand you a white feather. It's a symbol of being a coward. Mm -hmm. Think of the pressure that existed in this town. Businesses closed. Church bells rang. Everybody marched out, drummer boys were there, and there you were standing. It had to be an incredible amount of pressure. What happens, Boardman, he comes back, couldn't raise the regiment, he goes back to baking, and he's sent to the legislature. But this time he's sent as a Democrat. He becomes a selectman, and he stays in the baking business with his father, and they move from State Street up to the place where we refer to it as Boardman's Bakery. And that's, let's see, to give you the location. It's right where the travel agency is. Market Square. Uh, right in the Market Square. Uh, and then they move the Boardman building across the street. Third captain is Benjamin Day. He was a tough guy to find. Uh, he's born in 1823, dies in 1911, lived on Gregory Street. He's orphaned. He's a shoemaker. He'd gone to the Grand Banks. He ends up organizing the Marblehead Shoe Trimming Company, which ran until 1896, and the Finch Brothers took over that business. He's a grocer, and he's the last of the four companies to take Marblehead men out of Marblehead. Uh, he recruits enough people in one day that he's got his own regiment. They call him the Mugford Guards, except they have no weapons, no uniforms. And so all the school teachers in the town of Marblehead pitch their money together on one day, and all the women in one church went to work and made the uniforms for 40 members. Another individual came up with enough money to purchase the muskets. To carry. Now those muskets in 1861 were not as good as the muskets that you're going to see downstairs. The musket downstairs is a U.S. arsenal issue from Springfield. They're Springfield repeaters. If you know what that means, it's simply you don't have to put a shell in every time that you could bring up a series of shells. And that made the difference. Most of the Union forces don't see that until 1863. Captain Day uh, is a fairly successful captain. In fact, the governor of Massachusetts offers him a full commission in the U.S. Army in 1865. That's unusual. And this is in the regular U.S. Army. He refuses it. He goes back to being a grocer. And um, he ends up by serving through the entire Civil War and is enlisted in the 108th Pennsylvania Regiment. Now, this is not unusual for Marbleheaders to end up 
in regiments. You're going to find them in 37 different regiments. Michigan, somewhere in the Iron Brigade. The Iron Brigade, by the way, is a regiment that is almost decimated at Gettysburg. Uh, you find them in Illinois. You find them serving in California regiments. You find him in a lot of Massachusetts regiments. Uh, he's at the Battle of Laurel Hill. He's taken prisoner. 48 hours later, he's recaptured by Union forces. Um, he ends up by being assigned guard duty at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865 and is there to accept the surrender of weapons from Lee's army. Uh, when the Army of the Confederacy surrenders in Virginia. He comes back, we send him to the legislature. By the way, they all went to the legislature, but they all end up in Waterside Cemetery. <laughs> all of them, veterans of the GAR, the Goodwin Post. Now that veterans organization doesn't start until 1869. But there was a veterans organization before that. It was called the Minutemen of 1861. And they were a pretty powerful group. 20 years later, they hold a reunion. And that's when I could find out about uh, one of the captains named Richard Phillips. I kept saying, I can't find, this. by the way, think of the name Richard Phillips in the town of Marblehead. This is a lot of Richard Phillips. This Richard Phillips is the first of the captains to die, 1881. And how did I find that? In the parade, he is so sick, they put him in a barge. That's a wagon. And they towed him through the town in the parade. He dies a short time later. Um, and he's an interesting character. And you're going to see his picture downstairs. But he disappears very quickly, 1881. Uh, the next captain that I deal with, and I have a special interest, is my great-great-grandfather. And he has an unusual name, Samuel Chapman Graves. He's born in Salem, but we sort of just pass over that. Um, he's born in 1829. He dies in 1911. You begin to hear the dates. And it's something like us looking at World War II vets of today. Maybe the Korean War vets. I can remember being in elementary school, listening to vets from the Spanish-American War, old Mr. Sanborn, and thinking, boy, is he old. <laughs> and yet, that was only 1898, and I'm in school in the 1950s. I'm sure my father heard those Civil War veterans. And what they had to say, who knows? But Samuel Chapman Graves, <laughs> and there's a neat little story because when I was teaching the Civil War, I brought in a GAR belt buckle. I told him about my great-grandfather and where he had served and, and how long he had served. And I, they looked at me and I said, yes, this GAR belt buckle, I dug it up. And there were kids going, you dug it up? And finally, I had to realize what they were thinking is compared to what I was thinking. I simply went and threw my box of junk and dug it up. They thought I had gone to the cemetery and dug up the belt buckle. Those little things keep students' attention all the time. Some of them even worry about you. Well, Captain Samuel Graves is, is a shoe cutter. He's been involved in foreign trade. He's been all over the world, but not to New York City. Interesting because he's a lieutenant under Knott Martin, gets as far as New York, his gun goes off and he's shot in the foot. He returns to Marblehead. Martin goes on to Annapolis and Washington DC and my great-great-grandfather comes back to Marblehead. Uh, he lived on Bassett Street. Martin comes back Samuel Chapman Graves reorganizes Company C and he gets all these marble headers and off they go. This time they're under a famous general named General Benjamin Butler and they're sent south. Newborn, South Carolina. Benjamin Butler is not loved in the south. It's another name like saying Sherman in Atlanta. 
Butler um, uh, was noted for doing this when New Bern, North Carolina, and they've captured the city. And the women of New Bern were not too happy with Union soldiers being there. And how do we say this politely? They lifted up their skirts as they went past. Butler uttered that they be treated as prostitutes if they did that and they were to be captured. Butler was not a very popular individual in the South, let me assure you. Um, uh, Captain Graves is involved in a, a number of battles, uh, not major ones, he's a major one would be uh, Goldsboro. And I remember reading a newspaper for, uh, article in which he writes back about them lying in a swampy road waiting for the Confederates to attack and he says, do your duties and let Marblehead be proud of you. He survived, came back, and he raises another regiment, 27th, unattached. This is where you took all your veterans who had been wounded and you put them in a special veterans regiment. He's assigned to be in charge of Fort Warren in Boston, Massachusetts, and Fort Pl uh, Miles Standish in Plymouth. And he's there at um, Fort Warren at the time of the Confederate spy, the woman in black, who's executed. Anyone know this story? She broke into the prison to try to the fort to get her husband released. Because she broke in, she is now made prisoner. She's a Confederate spy, and she is executed as a Confederate spy. And she's the one who they talk about at Fort Warren who still roams the fort uh, when I pass on to the great place, either there or there. And I meet my great-great-grandfather. I'm going to ask if he knows her in any way. Um, interesting that he comes back here. And much like the veterans who return to Marblehead, when the war is over, they're treated well. There's no pension. There might be a parade. There might be a dinner. You've got the... Minutemen Association, you've got the GAR coming in 1869. Notice that's four years after the war is over. But it's not until the 1880s that this group begins to push for pensions. See, prior to this, if you fought in the war, they didn't give a pension. In most cases, they granted land. War of 1812, it was land. It was land. Here, the GAR began pushing for pensions. Not successful. President Cleveland vetoed it. Comment, if you're a soldier, you've been paid. And you've done your patriotic duty. Isn't it the 1890s pension? Well, um, good old uh, Sam gets a pension. His wife dies, but at the time, this is his second wife dies. And um, he's got a big pension of $15 a month. Well, my family still is talking about this pension. Because you see, the second wife died, and a Marblehead woman who's in her 30s marries my great-great-grandfather. And I can hear them now. She was after the pension. <laughs> I can hear them. I can hear my mother. I remember going to see Sam's daughter, my Aunt Luna, can you imagine being named Luna? Luna Graves, who married a Lewis in Lynn. So her name was Luna Lewis. She was an old lady in the 1950s. And I can remember my twin brother and I, when we had to go and visit, we'd watch my mother and we'd see her getting her hat ready and we'd run out to the car and she'd be, Come in, come in, give your Aunt Luna a kiss. She had a face that looked like the road map of 128. <laughs> nice lady, but it was a crater of the moon. And Aunt Luna, we'd hide from if we could. But hanging on the wall was this oil painting of good old Samuel Chapman Graves. And I remember her talking about that woman. Well, my great-great-grandfather died in 1911. 
His young wife died in 1913. She didn't get very much of the pension, but my family still talked about that. <laughs> By the way, the last Civil War pension of a wife was paid within the last 10 years. So you think about that. There were some that were marrying some of these veterans. And then comes some of the other names. I'm not going to give you all 1,000 names so you can breathe easy. <laughs> Benjamin F. Martin. Anybody know what he would have been involved in? Any of you went to the Gary School would know? What? He was in farming, milking. Martin's Dairy. He was a shoemaker, a farmer. He served under Captain Benjamin uh, Day. Uh, he came back, joined Company C, 8th Regiment, second lieutenant elected. He went into heavy artillery. Uh, he resigned from that, went into Company, uh, fourth, uh, company A, 4th Massachusetts Regiment. He's at D.C. and he's stationed guarding the capital for the rest of the war. He returns to Marblehead. <laughs> he had 13 children, and it was very interesting because he ran a massive campaign. He had a picture of himself taken with all his kids, and by the way, 10 of them were living in 1911, and sent it to the President of the United States, President McKinley, and said, I need the job as postmaster. Look at my children. He was appointed in 1889 and served until he died just at the time of the uh, election of Woodrow Wilson. Again, an esteemed and honored Civil War veteran. There are four individuals in the town of Marblehead who were sea captains. Very interesting. Josiah Cressy, you know the name Cressy from setting the, the massive record in the clipper ship. Uh, the Gregory brothers, Michael, Samuel, and William. Very interesting. All of those sea captains in the U.S. Navy did not last very long. They all came as Marblehead sea captains. They'd served. They'd run their own ships. They were probably very um, hard taskmasters. And I know the story of Mr. Cressy was that he was a tough sea captain. They usually survived one major sail. And when I say one major sail, uh, about a year being on blockade duty down in Florida, the Gulf area, South Atlantic. Uh, Michael Gregory is a very interesting one. He's on board a, a ship. He'd been involved in the China trade for years. He saw a British ship. Now, you have to think for a minute. It's 1863. He sees a British ship. He hails the British ship, checks the papers, and says, you're not a British ship, and finds a Confederate flag and discovers it is a Confederate ship trying to run the blockade to get supplies into the south. Captures it. But do you know the international hubbub that he created by pulling a British ship Aside, you remember in wait, 1812, we had a little conflict over impression, uh, impressment and uh, seizing of uh, ships at the seas, and the issue was freedom of the seas. Very interesting because all of these uh, sea captains served their country. The uh, William Dollarberg Gregory, the golden name, Captain Bill, dies in 1904. He seizes two. Uh, Confederate schooners, one of them flying a British flag. Um, he, by the way, he had started sailing at 15, had spent his life on clipper ships. In fact, he actually built a clipper ship known as the Sunny South. Um, <laughs> there's one individual who, who I sort of have to laugh at. If you go up to the Board of Selectmen's office, you're going to see his bust. Charles H. Snell, S. N-E-L-L-E-N, -L -L -E -N, Snell. Uh, born in 1836, uh, he's a shoemaker, and he's on board a naval ship. He's on a gun crew on the ship Heron. The gun misfired. So there's a live um, 
bag of explosives in the shell. So he volunteered and they tied rope to his ankles and jammed him down the barrel of the gun. And the gun is still hot, by the way. He gets down head first into the hot barrel, grabs the bag of explosives, and they pulled him out. By the time they got him out, he's unconscious. He's unconscious for two hours. He's offered a promotion in the US Navy, and he says, absolutely not. <laughs> I kept thinking, I don't like close quarters. I wouldn't be going down the barrel of a gun. Interesting guy. He comes back to Marblehead. He's, uh, he ends up, by the way, uh, serving on the ship Nahant, captures a number of Confederate uh, vessels. In fact, he's out looking for the Confederate raider called the Alabama. He ends up getting $1,000 prize money, and he's probably one of the last Grand Banks fishermen to go out. Um, We've got a, a guy named uh, William Allen. He's not very significant, other than at the end of the war, you looked at his pension record, he served in 31 major battles without a single scratch. We've got a marble header who entered as a sergeant and ended the Civil War as Colonel of the 8th Regiment. His name is Benjamin F. Peach, Jr. I like to say that it was a great story for him because he's promoted to Brigadier General uh, in the Massachusetts Militia. The problem was, you can't make a living. He leaves Marble and goes to Lynn. And you begin to wonder why. All of these Civil War veterans who return, they go back to the the business they were in, cordwainers, butchers, grocers. And think about it, 1865, the war is over. Shoe industry has been pumping out shoes in the Civil War. And suddenly, there's no need for massive shoes. Although Marblehead provided one-tenth of all the shoes being exported in the New England trade. What did they do? You know, they either became shoemakers and they took to their own feet and walked throughout New England selling shoes. You'd go up, stand on a piece of paper, trace your foot, they'd go back, make the shoe, and bring it back. A lot of them couldn't survive here in Marblehead. Two major fires wiped out the shoe factories. Sam Chapman Graves went to Lynn because that's where he could work in the shoe industry. Peach went to Lynn. That's where you could work in the shoe factory. Um, and yet, here's a guy at age 25. He's a colonel in the regiment. You got a guy named James C. Graves. He serves on board massive ships throughout the war. He's commended for bravery. He walks two miles through Confederate lines to get information from fleet on one side of Fort. Uh, Donaldson to the other side so Farragut, Admiral Farragut, could get the information. Uh, his ship is sinking. He's the assistant paymaster. Rather than getting in the boat, he goes down and gets all the money, all the records, all the letters, and carries them off the sinking ship. James C. Graves comes back to Marblehead. He's a shoemaker, but he raises his son in boating, and his son forms Graves' boat yard. You've got William uh, Goss, hacker. He's an interesting guy. One battle, he has three horses shot out from under him, and he just keeps going. He says it's not safe, so he transfers to the US Navy, and he's on board the ship Princeton, and he's on board the, a ship that the Merrimack sinks. I don't know. I think it would have stayed with the horses. <laughs> and then finally, the last Civil War event. Anyone know the year that last Civil War dies in the town of Marblehead? 1922. 1941. Wow. Think of that. And, and I kept saying, when did, was this guy born? 
and his name was Samuel A. Snow II. And you're going to look, there's a square up there. Okay, that's who the square is aimed for. He's 14 years of age, and he lied when he signed up. He told him he was 18. Big kid. So he goes on, and it's very interesting. He spends two years in military service. He's at Petersburg. He's wounded. He continues serving. He's on duty on, in April 1865, and... He's assigned to go to Ford's Theater to guard the dying president. He serves as an honor guard at Lincoln's uh, funeral, standing at Lincoln's body. Interesting, 1941. I was born in 1944. That's not that far away. Interesting. He had a pair of glasses. I don't know where they are now. But when they were carrying Lincoln's body from Ford's Theater across to the Peterson House, Lincoln's spectacles fell out of his pocket. And S Snow is supposed to have picked them up and brought them home. Interesting. Greatest expedition for him? was searching for Booth after the assassination because they sent parties out all over the place. And I keep thinking, there are so many stories of the 1,000 men who served. And by the way, I don't want to forget the women. Oh, during the war, they're raising money. The Ladies' Aid Society, they're making bandages. They're they're helping soldiers, and they're sending things to our soldiers that they would never have. They're sending foods, jellies that you buy tonight. They're sending anything that would bring comfort in terms of home. And I, I have to think that when these soldiers returned, those are the women who greeted them. And it wasn't 1868 that in Marblehead they started decorating the graves of those soldiers. By the way, in 1911, there were 100 of those 1,000 left. By the 1930s, there's five. In 1941, there's one. And I think about what the town of Marblehead must have been like. I think of the generation that was created. And I can only make a comparison to the World War II vets, to that generation that went through depression and a war, and then returned to their homes, and how they looked at the events that they had to face, whether they be tragic or positive. There had to be an incredible spirit that was created. This hat that I brought along, if you saw pictures of kids in 1900, 1911, they were wearing these hats. Much like kids wearing army hats in the 1950s. And it had to be an interesting time for these men. As a historian, I would have loved going up and saying to them, tell me about this. Tell me what happened. Salem News in the 1920s started interviewing some of these Civil War soldiers and getting their stories wasn't done enough. And then I think about the other side, the Confederates, in which they returned to absolutely nothing. There were no veterans organizations. Yeah, later on there were, but it was 1913. Most of our soldiers were dying. I can see that classic picture from the Civil War from Gettysburg in 1913, when you got these old timers wearing the hats, reaching across this bunch of shrubbery, Confederate shaking hand with Union soldiers. And I had to think about what it was like to be in the town of Marblehead. You wouldn't have found a Confederate flag flying here. 
that would have been equal to flying a Japanese flag or a Russian flag. And yet, we aren't that far away from that generation. And it gives us an important thing to story to remember. There's always the story. And it's for us to get to the stories now and record them as quickly as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Can I answer any questions without going into 1,000 men's lives? John, I remember as a kid when we went up to the cemetery Memorial Day, they always stopped at the GAR. That's right. With the four cannons. Yep. Is that where most of the Civil War fellows were buried? Or were they no, that, that would be for individuals who generally didn't have uh, families, family plots. Uh, if you look at these four Civil War captains that I've looked at, they're buried in family plots. Um, my great-grandfather is buried in the plot of his third wife. Uh, <laughs> I can hear that. Um, <laughs> but if most people don't pay attention to that spot because they head up on the hill to the gazebo. Yeah, and that stopped. It's not part of the Memorial Day. Right, right. And those cannons I look at and I... Uh, both our children that would get, and Linda will tell you, I used to get them all upset because I drive slowly past them and stop so the cannon is facing right toward the children. And they'd be ducking down like this. And I'd have to say, listen, this is the GAR. By the way, those GAR markers are now rusted and are disintegrating. So pretty soon, unless you're buried in that GAR plot or have that Union Stone. Uh, you won't know that this is Civil War soldier buried there. And by the way, I, a neat little story. I was in Arlington National Cemetery and um, I, I took a tour like all the tourists. And then later on I ran my own tours through there. But this guy said to me, do you know the difference between a Union grave and a Confederate grave in Arlington? I said, no. And he said, Union stones are curved. Confederate stones are pointed like the top of a tent. I said, why is that? And he said, so no Yankee ass can sit on a Confederate stone. <laughs> the Civil War isn't over yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Mrs. Dolliver. I have the honor to be married, John. I'm Linda Dolliver. But I also have the honor to serve on a little-known town committee called the Marblehead Forever Committee. And there will be a celebration this summer of the opening, the grand reopening of the Grand Army of the Republic Room. And of course, we all know that one of the pluses to that is that now it will be handicapped accessible and accessible to those students, students or citizens who uh, have trouble with stairs. Uh, so watch your newspapers this summer. Uh, it'll be a day-long affair, and I think it will be uh, a great celebration for the town of Marblehead. Yes. There's a GAR post in Lynn. I wasn't sure if that was also open and available or. Uh, was it, a, it, was it is. I have been there because remember I told you good old Mr. Graves went to Lynn. He joined that post as well. Uh, you go in there and I, I've been impressed. They have a wall. Nothing but pictures of their Civil War veterans. And there's one that's marked Samuel Chapman Graves and it's blank. There's no picture. And I didn't have a picture of this man until I went on something that I hate to mention, Ancestry.com. <laughs> and I typed in his name to see what happened, and up came, just this year, they said, we have a picture of him. Standing picture in full uniform, signed underneath Samuel C. Graves. He had it taken. A lot of soldiers did this because they didn't know if they were coming back. And so photography was important. And they carried with them a picture of their loved one and coins. So if they were killed, that money could be used to bury them because there were no buddy tags. That came after the Civil War. And then there was a new business. That's Undertakers moved. 
at this period of time, embalming the bodies and sending them back. Some tragic stories of the notice of death didn't arrive until the, the body had appeared. And there's stories of people going to church, coming home, and finding a casket on their front porch. So it had to be a tragic war uh, on all sides. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment. My mother used to say that uh, when she was a kid in school, that the probably six or ten or twelve of them that were left at the time um, used to come to the school and tell them about the battles, and they used to sit around and sing all the old, you know, tending on the old campgrounds and, right. and all the, you know, battle hymn of the Battle hymn of the Republic, yeah. yeah. It's a shame that we didn't have things to capture those individuals. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you. Yeah.